If I was to use the phrase, pasteurize our children, I don't think personally, even though that has a strong impact, that it's any less relevant. I know you hear pasteurization, we're thinking dairy and heat treatment. But what we've managed to do with our infants, according to this one study, which said the infants across the, uh, the United States in different areas, they had one common denominator. Some of the basic primary beneficial bacteria that were symbiotic with our growth and immune system, so on and so forth, is no longer there anywhere to be found. And the interesting aspect to that as well, too, is we are now in the age of the pandemic or the age we could term it dysbiosis. And so we don't know if this is something that's going to get better or if that pandemic mitigation where children don't play together, they don't go outside, everything's hyper sanitized, so on and so forth, can even begin to exacerbate this dire situation any worse than it currently is. And again, so strong words such as, well, you may relate them to evolutionary biology, such as mouth, multi-generational, attritional, loss of rep reproductive fitness may play a role, as well as dysfunctional dysbiosis. Of an essence, if you want to go back a few hundred years, whatever it is, it is still incredibly profound, incredibly disturbing, and really, in my mind, and as well as a lot of other researchers, a critical, critical emergency in reference to the benefit benefits to our species or humanity as a whole, at least according to the United States. Now, not to be a fear monger, the important part about bringing this research out uh, into play is the fact is, yes, maybe things can be done as far as eating beneficial foods to boost the uh, gut microbiota back up, uh, possibly uh, supplementation such as bifobacterium infidus, uh, things that can be done to parents if they're aware or even if you're not certain to have the child tested or whatever it is to see if these beneficial bacteria are available. And if not, mitigate or make alterations to improve the microbiome of that child so you give them a fighting chance in the future without a ton of medical ailments or disease or, or whatever related to basically that gut microbiome access being disrupted, not only just for the immune system, but for a positive outlook. But let us proceed as follows. This particular title said it best. It's from Genetic Engineering News. Don't fault me for that, but just the same. Metagenomics analysis finds 90% of U.S. infants studied lack key gut bacterium for breast milk utilization and immune system development. I'm going to refer you to, it's not overly detailed, but these are what's called box plots. Those which are familiar, which most of our audience is into data analytics or biostatistics. You're looking at a box plot here or basically a chart or grouping of box plots. The researchers went as far to explain the 25 to 75% in the quartiles and everything else of the box plots. Look, how many boxes do you actually see? That's how incredibly depleted the microbiome of these children are for bacteria which you corn commonly associate as being there. Excuse the inflection in the voice, but I was just as shocked as anybody else upon reading this data. This really, really is something that needs to be addressed and it need be, needs to be addressed yesterday. But to proceed as follows. All right. Another good title in reference to this is also from the full published study, which I'll have the link for you. Uh, so you can follow it on your own and validate or delve into the information a bit more. B. Infidus, a key infant gut symbiont is missing in 90% of infants. And again, I also too highlighted some points of interest in reference to the particular full study because we're not going to have that much time to go through all of it, but at least you could pick up some visual cues as we proceed forward. And here we go. Now into the public release, and then we'll come back to the full study itself. New study, nine out of 10 U.S. infants experience gut microbiome deficiency. And that is really, truly an understatement. That's why I want to show you the other titles first. Largest study to date benchmarks widespread 
underrecognized microbiome linked risk to infant immune system development, antibiotic resistance, acute conditions such as colic and diaper rash. And that is just an understatement. Now we're going to go into the public release a little deeper. And so you get an idea, a perspective of how important this truly is. The vast majority of infants are deficient in this key gut bacterium from the earliest weeks of life. And this is completely off the radar. No one expected it. You're going into this research expecting to find these common bacteria to be prevalent in the microbiome of infants. And you're doing the research and all of a sudden it's not there. And even worse than that, we'll get to that in a second. All right. Most parents and pediatricians alike, said the author. Basically, the study provides the clearest picture to date of just how widespread this issue is and highlights the need to address B. infantis deficiency in the infant gut right from the start. B. infantis has, well, has been widely considered one of the most prevalent bacteria in the GI tracts of infants. Again, was considered the most prevalent as in the majority. But to proceed. According to its absence from such a wide swath of outwardly healthy infants is surprising. When present, B. infinis breaks down carbohydrates in breast milk called human milk oligosaccharides, HMOs, which are otherwise inaccessible to the infant. So you understand that. Without B. infantis, they can't break down the carbohydrates from the human breast milk and other nutrients as well, which are otherwise inaccessible to the infant. In fact, B. infinis differs from bifobacteria species in its unique adaptation to human breast milk and is specifically in its ability to break down these HMOs into usable nutrients. So you can see the scenario there. Here's someone's breastfeeding for the benefit of the baby or the infant, and all of a sudden, this child doesn't have B. infantis in their system, so a majority of this possibly may be being broken down in the way that we're familiar. All right, the usable nutrients. Perhaps more importantly, B. infantis is increasingly linked to the development of the infant immune system, protecting the infant intestinal tract from potentially dangerous bacteria, as well as lower incidence of common childhood conditions like colic and diaper rash. Researchers also discovered that potentially, here, ready for this? Think of it like the microbiome as a school bus. And those 20 seats are going to be filled. So you manage to take those 20 seats with all the good bacteria and such like that but those 20 seats are still going to be filled what did they become filled with or who is sitting in those seats to proceed research all discovered that potentially dangerous bacteria comprised on average you already see it 93 percent of all bacteria in the infant gut microbiome Again, forgive me for the inflection because I'm just, as I'm reading through this, I'm going, oh my freaking gosh, this is just unbelievable. 93% of all bacteria in the infant gut microbiome have been, is comprised of dangerous bacteria as of today. To proceed with the most prevalent bacteria being E. coli, Clebacilla pneumonia. Salmonella, strep Streptococcus, and Staphylococcus, and C. diff. So it took all the positive bifobacterium, whatever it is, I don't know how it happened, uh, you know, sanitize this, antibiotic that, uh, kids don't play together, so on and so forth, and again, who knows how the pandemic mitigation effort's going to play into exacerbating this. I don't think it's going to make it better, but again, that's a hypothesis or a guess on my part. And replaced it with all dangerous bacteria. Many of these bacteria are known to harbor genes related to antibiotic resistance. In fact, a total of 325 antibiotic resistant genes were found in gut bacteria with more than half, 54% of those genes being those that confer bacterial resistance to multiple antibiotics. Now we move forward to the conclusion. Quote, the infant gut is essentially a blank slate at birth and rapidly acquires bacteria from mom and the environment. Quote, We were surprised not only by the extensive lack of good bacteria, but the incredibly high presence of potentially pathogenic 
bacteria and an environment of antibiotic resistance that appears to be so widespread, end quote in the researcher. The infant gut microbiome in the U.S. is clearly dysfunctional, and we believe this is a critical factor underpinning many of the infant and childhood ailments we see today across the country, end quote. Again, link to the study, so on and so forth. The most interesting part about this research here, and again, the reason why I wanted to bring it to, to light, not just to basically be a fear monger in, in reference to that, is that it does appear that certain things possibly can be done on an individual level. If not on a national level, if the national health care system is not going to pay any attention to this or whatever it is, then maybe people can do it on their own level by making sure the child develops a decent microbiome in any way, shape, or form that's scientifically sound. But however, though, you know what? Let's bring it to the attention, throw it out there, see what happens. It's better to know than to not know. And again, with other dysbiosis uh, measures, pandemic, because we are in the age of dysbiosis, uh, with the pandemic mitigation factors, you know, pets, things like that, fermented foods, good bacteria sources, so on and so forth, can play a huge role in giving children a fighting chance against a ton of future uh, possible pitfalls that are out there now. So you can start building those defenses now. And you know what? It plays a huge role. Gut microbiome access as well. Beneficial bacteria has been shown to remove, uh, improve mood, uh, reduce anxiety, so on and so forth in, uh, in certain studies. Why not? Get that benefit right now. And again, just knowing this right now, it's that widespread. It needs to be brought to the attention publicly. If the mul if the multimedia, if the media doesn't do it, then let's do it on our own. Again, not the fear monger, but give people a tool in order to improve the health of those around them in a positive fashion. And with that in mind, I also promised to cover this, but I'm only going to give a sound bite to it in reference to it. This was an interesting study from Yale, and again, it goes to the sanitation aspect once again. And I'll read this one quote so I can have the study linked as well so you can follow it too because it's important in reference to our food supply and especially to our children. And when I talk about our children per se, I'm talking about our children as a community as a whole so we look out for each other. We'll proceed as follows. Overactive food quality control system triggers food allergies. It comes from Yale University. Food allergies have been increasing dramatically across the developed world for more than 30 years. I can play a play with the gut microbiome, but also this as well. For instance, as many, and this number shocked me. I expected it to be there, but not this high. As many as 8% of U.S. children, of children in the U.S. now experience potentially lethal immune system responses to such foods as milk, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Scientists have struggled to explain why that is. A prevailing theory has been that food allergies arise because of an absence, again, this goes back to dysbiosis. If you're not familiar with the term dysbiosis, now would be a good time to get familiar with it. Uh, not to arise because of the absence of natural pathogens such as parasites in the modern environment, which in turn makes part of the immune system that evolved to deal with such natural threats hypersensitive to certain foods, obviously the point about practically being anaphylactic. Now again, the information will be there for you to follow. The links will be there to follow as well. But however though, again, information that you could potentially use per se in improving the microbiome and of not just the children look at yourself as well too but in any case for infants be infantis as far as if someone's breastfeeding or whatever it is you know possibly go to the pediatrician whatever it is get an opportunity to get uh, some samples check out the the breakup of the microbiome if someone suffering from colic or other uh, intestinal issues per se at an early age and it's unexplainable maybe this can help but again as always also to again to reiterate many of you may know we do data analytics in reference to certain pandemics going around right now so you can look at the data from the other side that generally you're not getting um revealed to you per se not in a hidden way or a conspiracy way just that they don't find it as important as you may think it is and that's the data we look at on Saturday or Sunday morning. And I think we looked at vaccine distribution, 
how many if the vaccines were distributed appropriately, what it should be. We're also looking at hospitalization rates, ICU rates, COVID occupancy rates of those ICU beds, just so you can basically fact check your politicians. Where did the fact checking should actually start? Again, Ralph Trigiano signing off. Links will be there. Hope you find this information used. Again, not to fear monger, but again, to give you the tools so you become aware and therefore can adapt accordingly to that particular Ralph signing off once again. Gratitude. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all once again on Saturday, Sunday morning. Saturday, Sunday morning. Then, next Tuesday. I'll you next time. Bye.